This is Dr. Wayne Casio. He has been a distinguished professor, chair position. He has held a number of positions in the management discipline, a very prolific author, writer. Uh, he has written books and great papers, uh, known as a great HR scholar, human resource scholar. So Way too kind. <laughs> we are talking to the expert in the field. And uh, lately, his work uh, in this area and other areas uh, in terms of leadership, diversity, inclusion, and other areas in healthcare is sort of informing both scholarship and, and practice uh, quite significantly. Uh, I'm Jibon Kuntia. I'm also a faculty in information systems uh, and health administration. I lead the Health Administration Research Consortium at the business school. Uh, I'm pretty much involved in this health workforce area. I started from the health IT digitization uh, kind of areas, but then when I when I started researching more, I found that there are other issues around this IT healthcare marriage that we need to discuss. And diversity and inclusion is one of the major facets of that dynamics. Broadly, what I want to understand uh, that why this is an interesting topic, how we started what are the implications and stuff like that? So you were mentioning something about the DEI. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, abbreviated DE and I, is really an imperative for organizations everywhere. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. People realize today that, you know, there's research that shows that when you have diverse teams, you get greater innovation. Uh, companies want, or organizations want workforces that reflect their customer base. And uh, that's particularly important in healthcare because there are lots of uh, cultural nuances, uh, subtleties that can easily be missed in uh, interaction with patients. And so this is a, uh, it's really an imperative. And uh, what we did in our study was try to uh, compare and contrast three different workforce pathways achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I can talk about each one. You know, one was improve the DE&I of the, of the current workforce. And uh, largely we do that by trying to change mindsets, um, doing a lot of uh, in-house training uh, for people, learning and development opportunities, um, opportunities to work together on, uh, on, on teams with diverse members. Uh, getting to know them uh, more intensely. Uh, a second strategy was was to use uh, multiple channels to recruit um, new employees and and to improve diversity in that way. Uh, you know, the first strategy focuses on internal an internal approach within the organization. This recruit strategy focuses on um, bringing in people from outside. The organization to improve diversity, but then you'd have to also uh, uh, be sure that the culture values it, not only just having diversity. Uh, it's often been said that um, uh, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. You know? And so even if you recruit from outside, uh, you still have to focus on inclusion and uh, making sure that everybody is asked to dance, not just invited to the party. And then the uh, the third strategy that we looked at, compare and contrast, was uh, collaborating primarily with universities uh, to improve the pipeline of talent and, uh, and, and to emphasize uh, the need for a more diverse workforce. So we looked at those three alternative workforce uh, pathways, um, we took a look at the uh, business and service benefits um, that, that flow from having a high level of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And some of those include not only increasing revenues, which is the obvious one, um, but also enhancing brand reputation. Enhancing the reputation of, of an organization as a place where people want to work, you know, where they feel like they belong, and that they can make meaningful contributions where they are, uh, that their opinions are valued um, and, and cherished. And so the bottom line is that organizations really need results-driven strategies. And some of that might involve changing uh, incentive schemes. We've seen this, uh, big banks are doing this. 
uh, with their executive compensation schemes to actually make some portion of their bonuses, executive bonuses, dependent on not only attracting a more diverse workforce, but retaining them as well. And that puts the burden on senior leaders to really take the lead in uh, in modeling what D, E, and I looks like. And, uh, you know, that's that's something that uh, every organization needs to look at. What other examples would come to your mind when we talk about the importance of the impediment, as you said, about diversity and inclusion? If we don't have it in healthcare, how consequential it can go? Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. And, you know, perhaps the most obvious one, you're going to laugh when I when I tell you this story, was with Avon Corporation. And they sell, uh, among other things, women's cosmetics. And think about a white woman trying to sell an African-American woman cosmetics. You know, they're not going to get the skin tone right or things like that. And so Avon realized early on that they need to have a workforce that reflects their customer base because that workforce um, that does reflect the customer base will appreciate and understand subtleties, nuances, like you just described. Um, Jibon, how would an Indian physician have addressed the same question or issue that you brought to, to the physician? One an, Another extreme of it, an Indian physician would never suspect Hajar, but he will start what we call as a Ayurveda. So he'll start as a toxin cleansing process, uh -huh. immediately go to the pain area. Uh, so I would say in India, still the practices are more about where exactly is the pain uh, rather than taking the body as a whole. So there are multiple approaches, but he would not put spicy food as the center of attraction. That's the top cause, yeah. <laughs> good example, good example, because that Indian physician probably grew up the same way you did. You know, and understands this okay. from personal experience. Yeah. And Jiban, I think it would be helpful to uh, listeners to uh, talk a little bit about our results in terms of those three workforce pathways, the improve, recruit, and collaborate, about which one turned out to be most effective. So so hold on there. So, I mean, before jumping to that, I mean, I know we love our paper and to talk about yeah. <laughs> this issue is big. In U.S. health workforce context, how big would you say this issue is? Uh, given, you know, we have our health workforce has more than 50% of, of white Americans and 20% and somewhere between less than 10% black and other population, other health workforce. So my point is, is it really an issue or we can live with that? From a health system perspective, Look at the demographics of the population that you serve. You know, if you're in an urban environment as opposed to a rural environment, uh, diversity and equity and inclusion means very different things, right? Because in the in the urban environment, you're going to have a much larger mix of, of age, race, sexual orientation. Pick any dimension that you like: uh, age, gender, um, ethnic. Uh, representation, et cetera, than you would in a it probably in a rural environment. So every organization needs to have a, a a very clear understanding of the demographics of the population that it serves. Actually, one way to look at it, yes, maybe urban uh, folks are more diverse. Uh, they understand that, but also they demand that kind of diversity in terms of care. But also, uh, we have seen a lot of migration happening within U.S. itself. People are moving from the cities to stay in the rural areas. For example, my work is in Denver City, but I'm 40 miles away from there. Mm -hmm. So when I go to a healthcare center here, it actually can be coined as a rural healthcare, somewhere in Parker, semi-rural, semi-urban. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so not only in urban areas, but we need to also take into account the rural uh, diversity in terms of that rural area. In our mountain cities, I see there is a lot of immigrants who are also there. Sure. Well, again, it goes back to really understanding the demographic profile of the people that you serve. And and to add one point over here, I, I have been facing these kind of issues when my daughter is talking to me. Uh, so we have started acknowledging more about LGBTQ in the society. 
uh, mm -hmm. in the legal uh, structure itself. So that diversity is sort of an added layer now. In other words, uh, we have to be respectful as well as some of them, they demand a little bit of sympathy, empathetic care, resume, and sure. so on. And respect. Yeah. Respect more than anything else. People yeah. want two things, respect and preserve their dignity. Sometimes I feel like this, you know, you are a man, so if you are suffering mental health, you should not mm -hmm. be a man. Well, that's deserving that. No, I'm a man. I also have feminine tendencies and I can have a mental breakdown. So yeah, so these are issues that actually sort of when we talk about DNI, the broad, when we start opening up the layers of the onion, these are some major societal movements, but also in terms of evidence practice that the healthcare is following. So when we combine both, I think the issue is much more different, let's say, than just a plain customer base uh, comparing to a healthcare customer base. It's much more consequential. It can kill somebody, I would say if we are not careful. Well, there's no question about that. And you know, many years ago, I was I was doing a, a, a business case study at Starbucks in Seattle. And uh, the uh, gentleman that I was talking to about diversity was an immigrant from Cuba. And I said to him, what does diversity mean to you? And he said, I think of it as big D and little d. Big D being the things you can see that are obvious. You know, your age, your gender, uh, maybe your ethnic background, your accent, how you speak. Uh, but he said, what really makes us different is little d. And these are all of the different experiences that we've had, different educational pathways, um, uh, different types of training that we've had. You know, we hear oftentimes in organizations, oh, the, uh, the salespeople can't talk to the the IT people, they speak a different language, you know, or finance people speak a different language from, from uh, production people. And that's an element of diversity as well. And I, I like this big D and small D in the sense uh, uh, I have seen corporations and big institutes, big organizations uh, saying that oh, we are diverse and yeah, a lot around big D, but you walk into the meeting, they would, I mean, because I'm in the other side of it, they would look at you, oh, really? And or the subtle things, so I could not understand what you said. Uh, now, I call it as like a like a walk the talk kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk about that, but we really don't walk the micro parts of it. And that pains. At the end of the day, it, it pains. And it takes away that cultural and situational value. And I think one thing I would brought over here, probably the Silicon Valley movement in the last two decades, has sort of equalized much of it in the in the fintech industry, in the tech industry. And if we walk into Apple's or Google's or IBM's, we will see much more of this diversity being present there. Uh, whereas many other uh, so-called legacy institutionalized environments uh, probably may not have that. And healthcare falls in that latter part of it. Yeah, and it's the, it's the little d all those other things that really make us different from each other. So one of the assertions in our paper, we say, okay, one thing obviously to train the next generation uh, who are already in the schools, maybe they are more open to D&I because they already see that diversity population and things have been inculcated. But actually where the pain pinches more is about the middle managers, the people who are already working and that's mm -hmm. where we we decided that uh, just rather than just focusing on recruitment strategies, uh, if we put a line, give us a statement on DNI, and people will give it and recruit uh, the person who has a good yeah. statement. That's one part of the story. But I think our recognition here is that's not going to solve the current workforce. So that's where we choose the other things that how we can improve. Uh, through a collaborative. So those three, I would say, pathways uh, that we chose uh, have some reflection that has gone into that, why they are important, right? Oh, yeah. And Jiban, I wanted to just share with you an example of a company that illustrates this uh, uh, the positive side of DE&I very nicely, and that's PepsiCo. Uh, I was just speaking with uh, an exec at PepsiCo several weeks ago, and what he told me was that... Um, uh, leaders at all levels 
fully 50% of their bonus compensation is based on how well they develop the people who report to them. Because you can't get promoted unless you've trained somebody to step into your position. So none of this hoarding people or playing favorites and so forth, you're going to be judged based on how well you develop the people who report to you. And that's part of inclusion, a very important part of inclusion. And I think we can all learn from that because it goes back to the old saw. People do the things that get rewarded for doing. Yeah. Pay is a very tangible way to reward people. And that is uh, our management literature talks a lot about this intrinsic and extrinsic rewards and stuff okay. like that. But the big part is that, yeah, whatever they are paid for, if they're not paid for that, correct. You won't pay attention to it. Yeah. Since you mentioned PepsiCo, one important uh, thing that comes into my mind, see, we have seen enough Wall Street Journal articles and New York Times articles that Walmart goes, expands into these countries, or Starbucks goes and expands. Mm -hmm. It fails because it could not understand the dynamics of that country. Talk about the dynamics. They talk about potholes on the roads and bad supply chain. But also there is this whole concept around local culture, navigating that. And Pepsi mm -hmm. is probably successful because Indira Nui, the CEO, she could understand a lot of cultures quite significantly. So in, when, when PepsiCo expands to South American countries or Asian countries, she carries a different flavor drink. Of course, yeah. So that need, I mean, South South American uh, drinks has to be different than what we drink here. So, yeah. so another imperative over in the DNI, if I'm a corporate CEO, I would think it helps in my global strategies very significantly. I have the guy next table who can pick up the phone and talk to someone in the cultural sense. I'm leaving the language part of the story. Yeah. yeah. Sense and the expansion, then understanding of the whole thing. So, multinational companies expanding internationally would then would not face these debacles that is happening. If, oh, and the there's a well known book in international business called Big Business Blunders. You're probably familiar with it. Yes. And it's it's full of examples of companies that made huge cultural mistakes when they moved into a different country. So exactly what you're saying. Now I would like you to expand a little bit on those three strategies and the modalities, mechanisms that we call pathways and talk a little bit more about that. Let's talk about collaborate, for example, which is collaborating with universities. And this means you may have a graduate of a particular university um, who goes back and establishes contact with former professors. In this case, if it's a healthcare organization, they could... Uh, offer uh, internships, for example, for university students to come and experience what it's like to work in, in that particular organization. And um, the nice thing about internships, as you know very well, is that it gives people kind of a, a job tryout, you know, a sense of what it's really like to work there. And this is a pathway to be able to attract people into your organization uh, a, a, on a permanent basis. And so, uh, you know, the collaborate really means establishing contacts with universities, um, maybe setting up at job fairs uh, would be one example, but also these, uh, these paid internships, very attractive to students and uh, universities um, typically are, are, are very uh, open to collaborating with healthcare organizations or other types of business organizations. That's the collaborate piece. Again, it speaks to um, widening the pipeline of talent that we can attract to our organization. You know, recruit again speaks to uh, multiple channels, multiple channels. And uh, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, Cisco Systems in uh, in Silicon Valley was trying to at attract programmers. And it sent recruiters into bookstores uh, and to find people who were browsing through programming books, you know, things like that. They had a program called Make a Friend at Cisco, where even if you're not interested in a job, just call and talk to somebody who does the same kind of work that you do to get a flavor for what Cisco does. And the third thing it did was actually advertise at home and garden shows. 
because the people they were trying to attract were typically young professionals who were just starting out, starting families. And they actually sent recruiters to home and garden shows to find these people. Now, I use these examples only to illustrate the fact that these are not typical recruitment channels that people think of. You know? and, and that was the second prong of our workforce pathway was recruit um, using multiple channels. And, uh, and this means thinking outside the box, if you will, of where we might find people who can fulfill the kind of work that we need done. And then of course, the first one, we talked a little bit about it already, was simply working with your current workforce to improve um, the culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, that's the belongingness piece. So in other words, one of the messages over here is traditionally organizations used to give an advertisement in a newspaper or somewhere yeah. and people used to apply. I think that era is gone. Uh, let me also here say that before that newspaper advertisement, I remember the Sunbelt uh, Sears case studies uh, in the early 80s and 90s and they going into the agricultural sun belts and trying to talk to customers and trying to understand what they are. So even the seat height in some of the tractors has to be suit to the farmer who is working there or the fan inside the tractor has to be in a specific way or the handle has to be bigger or smaller. These, <laughs> these are field knowledges that you don't get from a typical advertisement kind of pulling the yeah. workforce. So yeah. Going to the field, now that field, the connect, connectedness to the field, customers, stakeholders broadly for any managerial position has moved now just from the advertisement recruit pattern to more of a very synchronous, uh, dynamic, collaborative environment. We need to be present in the digital era. We need to have LinkedIn, so people should be pulled from that. People should maybe sometimes out-of-box thinkers. Yeah. When we yeah. talk about healthcare, one of the things like you are giving examples of Cisco's and Apple's and, and, and since I'm doing the health IT research more, I see this, there is this uh, we in healthcare and they in the IT field. That has been the language so far. Uh, but then as we are moving more towards digital health, we need out-of-box thinkers from IT field being present here. And we need doctors to be present in the uh, design of a system. So design, yes. Design part. So so that uh, going through the layers or the, or the verticals and horizontals and making this integration happen is the key. So underlying our recruitment and collaboration is this uh, concept that uh, just don't be a desk manager in terms of when it comes to hiring principles. Oh, yeah. And not only that, G. Bond, but, you know, if you look at the way companies or organizations are writing their job descriptions these days, they are building in mention of diversity, equity and inclusion so that people reading these things can say, oh, this is a place where I could feel like I belong. And they're going out of their way not to just focus only on the tasks that somebody is going to do. And that also sends back, uh, because we are educators and we are on the other side of the of the recruitment, uh, where we are, yeah. mm -hmm. we are busy in, in training our students to be better products and better managers and so on and so forth. That also sends a signal to us saying that, send the guy, send the guy to push him to the push him to get an internship, push him to walk that thing and push him to make a copy of the paper in an organization. I think now one of our responsibilities to talk about and incorporate more of these examples that you are talking about uh, in terms of DNI more into the into our curriculum. And whenever we're giving an example, uh, giving any concept uh, without diversity, without diversity and inclusion, how this thing may pan out and with diversity and inclusion, how this may pan out in terms of global spread or richness or, or reach and, and to the customers and expanding. So uh, the, 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 the burden lies on the both the sides of the fence. Right? <laughs> That's right. Because as educators, we are the suppliers of labor. You know, we often don't look at it that way. I always thought of myself as a supplier of labor. And, uh, you know, we need to model DE and I in our own classrooms. And when we do that, people expect to find that same kind of environment at places where they work. And if they don't, they quit. And right now we know 
with lots of people quitting, uh, there are lots of opportunities to move around. So every organization has to ask itself, you know, what are we doing to become an employer of choice so that people want to be here? You know? Yes. So what we did in our study was look at, you know, which which of these pathways uh, seems to provide the greatest, be- not only business benefits, but service benefits. And uh, do, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think that's a that's a very important aspect that we just didn't talk about business benefits and the service benefits. So we have been latching a lot about customers and expansion. So uh, yeah, go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was just going to say. I mean, what we found was that the uh, uh, the strategy that seemed to yield the largest um, business and customer service benefits was improve improve the the current workforce. And that means training people to recognize uh, unconscious biases that they might have and really teaching them how to work together Uh, because the research is pretty clear that uh, diverse teams seem to be more innovative, um, you know, and they solve problems um, in different ways, um, but also more effective ways as well. So there's a a lot that uh, uh, practicing uh, managers can take away in understanding the benefits of promoting DE and I in their own organizations. So in other words, when we're talking about that, particularly we started with this consequential nature in healthcare. So obviously uh, it's just not the business benefit, it's just not the profit. I mean, I think it helps when a doctor or a physician or a nurse greets us in our own language or... or... Oh, yeah. So that that immediately brings that connectedness piece uh, Ownness, or oh, okay, so he's one of ours, so let yep. me do him more. Or I, I don't uh, say, I don't completely neglect uh, what he's saying or he's saying. So it, 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 it sort of percolates down very much into the communication coordination part of the healthcare uh, dynamics. It that- really sends a signal. It sends a signal directly, you know, when you can address someone in their own language. No question about that. You know, they'll feel a lot more welcome. Correct. So, so then patient is empowered. He's he's satisfied. He feels doing certain things. You know, if a diabetic patient, he would run a mile extra, and those kind of things then bleeds into the wellness and health paradigm quite significantly. You know, a good example of this is uh, is Miami. You know, Miami is uh, has such a large Hispanic uh, presence. Uh, lots of people from South America, immigrants, etc. And uh, Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami is known for its effort, and it had to, its efforts to be able to reach out to people in their own language, which largely was Spanish. And so, uh, you know, they've been doing this for many, many years. And the payoff is that uh, when those uh, Spanish-speaking people come in as patients, they feel welcome when someone can speak to them in their own language. And Miami had to do it because of the volume of uh, Spanish speaking patients that were coming into the hospital. But for many other organizations, it's just good business practice. Yes, yes. What should be the message here? Uh, because we did survey around 120, 130 CEOs. I would not say that's a complete representation of the whole population of health system CEOs, uh, but a substantial good sample. Uh, so what should be the message all across the U.S. for almost all health systems uh, mm-hmm. that you would like to, to tell them? Well, I would say, you know, what we found uh, empirically was, was that the, uh, the pathway improved the current workforce seemed to be most effective. But this isn't going to happen on its own. It really requires leadership from the top, modeling from the top. When people come in, they look at the composition of the uh, executive management team. You know, and uh, and that's what I mean, starting at the top. So I think senior folks need to think carefully about what kinds of strategies they w- they would like to implement in order to improve diversity, equity and inclusion and then tie those strategies to uh, rewards that they offer to their direct reports. Uh, we mentioned the PepsiCo example. 50% of your bonus depends on how well you develop the people who report to you. I think that's a good lesson for any organization. 
I don't I don't think we have seen any corporate uh, index or ranking around these terms. Uh, you know, if I'm walking into a hospital or I'm making a call to a clinic, I uh, should, if that flashes out, okay, this clinic has 80% on the DNI score, I'll feel more comfortable. You bet. Yeah. You bet. I think yeah. that's, a, that's a good uh, segue here for as a call for the health systems and broadly in US to build more into an index and, and more uh, popularize this. I agree. So great. And I think uh, I think that has been our, our nice discussion. Anything when you you want to add? No, I, I you know, one of the things that I've really appreciated, we've been talking about diversity and look at you and me. You know, we come from such different educational backgrounds, but we work very effectively together. And, you know, I look at when I work with you, I look at it as an opportunity to learn, to learn from you, to learn from somebody who's got experiences in a very different area. And, and it, that's the message I think that we want to get across to organizations is that, you know, there is some of the, the real benefit from diversity is learning, you know, and it takes a little sense of curiosity about other people and what makes them successful. And uh, I've certainly learned from you, G. Bon, and in collaborating with you, and that's been a pleasure, you know, over the years. Uh, two authors, uh, Swain Ning and, and Roland Stacy, could not join, but their inputs have also significantly helped us to craft the paper. Absolutely. And yes, we bring different value sets uh, to this research and we could make it, I think I'm proud of what has come out in the paper. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me.